read a lot about Murray, you probably have read a lot about some of the things that he has done for the movement, some of the things that he has always been so excellent at, keeping us online. He is radical, he's charming, and he is warm. And also, he and I can see eye to eye, so we don't have to adjust the microphone. <laughs> Murray is a special friend, regardless of the optical illusion. And I think that after you have the opportunity to visit with him tonight, and I'd like the environment to be like that, that you too will come to care for him as much as many of us do. The format for tonight, since we couldn't really put you around on cushions and move the tables and have a fireplace and a little wine and all, is that basically Murray's going to talk to you for a while, just for a while, and then we have some floor mics set up, and you're going to have the opportunity to talk to him. And Murray always responds. <laughs> this is one of those special historical events as part of our 10th anniversary convention that doesn't really have anything to do with a lot of the politics that we might get involved with over the course of the next few days or some of the things that you might have read. This is for you getting to know Murray and for Murray to hear what you're thinking about. I guess the very first thing that I ever read by Murray was For a New Liberty. And it's been said that that book alone probably has converted more people to libertarian philosophy than any other piece of literature. But Murray, of course, never stopped with that. He is probably the most prolific writer of any of us in the movement and has published in just about every journal, small magazine, some people call them rags, as well as having his own volumes. There isn't much more that I can tell you about him since you know so much, it's with a great deal of pleasure that I share with you tonight one of my best friends, Murray Rothbard. Thank you, victory. <laughs> uh, but thank you very much, ML, for a lovely, lovely introduction. And uh, this is really a nostalgia city here for me tonight, in keeping with the occasion of being an LP10 convention. And uh, so uh, what I'm going to do is go back and talk about the old days. And uh, whatever prominence I have in the libertarian movement is probably mostly due to the fact that I've been around longer than anybody else. So that I can I can talk about the old days and, um, and be, you know, give new information. Um, two things, uh, two landmarks for me sort of struck me is that the movement has really grown tremendously in the last uh, 20 years or so, actually more than that. Um, two sort of landmarks that stick in my mind. One is that uh, when I was sitting around my living room with my, with my eight, eight, eight associates and colleagues, which I thought was the whole movement. I, I, I'm not saying it was the whole movement, I just didn't know about anybody else. I'm sure there are other living rooms around all over the place, I just never heard of them. And uh, we used to joke around a lot about what future historians would write about us. And of course, we're just considered a big, big yuck because, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, eight crackpots sitting around in, in the living room talking about wild ideas. <clears throat> that was sort of like an inside academic joke. But what happened about, I don't know, about, like, I guess six or seven years ago, a friend of mine who's a histor professional historian started attacking me. Why didn't I keep all this precious memorabilia from the old days, the early history of the movement? And uh, I realized, by God, future historians are now interested. So that's, uh, that, that was a la one landmark. Uh, <clears throat> second landmark for me was that, uh, considering again that we started off with you know, two or three people and, and then escalated to eight about, after about 10 years, uh, <laughs> the uh, 
was the first time about 10 years ago when I was attacked by an, another budding libertarian for not being a pure Rothbardian. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> now, that's a, that, was a, that was a real shockeroo. <laughs> and uh, after I got over the first shock, I realized, well, this is great. You know, I mean, the movement's really advanced, but I could be attacked for not being a pure Rothbardian. The, uh, okay, the first thing, I, in the old days, we used to ask people, when we found another libertarian, <clears throat> which was a very rare occasion, like one a year, the first thing we'd ask him or her was, well, how did you get started? How did you become a libertarian? Because it was obviously a rare event. I'm not sure whether you people ask each other that these days or not. Or not. But uh, I'm looking forward to the great day in the future. I, I figure now in the transition period. And someday, not too distant future, It'll just, you know, just be a matter of course, everybody's a libertarian. You're trying to figure out why is this person not a libertarian? <laughs> so, uh, however, in the old days, that was the big, uh, big question. How, how, how'd, you, how'd, you get, how'd, you get, how'd you get here? And so what I'm going to do tonight is sort of take you back at how I, you know, how I, got, how I got started, which is a major area of my own expertise. <laughs> the, uh, <clears throat> well, <clears throat> first place, I started off, I think, uh, my first libertarian instincts or expressions or whatever came about as a little tyke. Uh, I first entered the public school system as a uh, young lad and hated the guts of it. Okay, that was <laughs> the first experience. I hated everybody. I hated the teachers. I hated the administrators. I hated my fellow colleagues. <laughs> so uh, I made an enormous amount of trouble for my parents. They finally yanked me out, put me into a private school, which I loved and then whatever, flourished. And so my teeny mind immediately made a connection. Public school, bad, private school, good. <laughs> uh, I, I did not, of course, articulate that to a full system at that point. <laughs> um, then uh, I was growing up, you have, to really, have to think back now, this is really an act of imagination, historical imagination. Of, to, to recall gro what growing up, or to realize what growing up in New York in the, in the 1930s was like, 1930s and 40s. Um, as a uh, young middle-class Jewish lad, uh, everybody I knew, this is literally everybody, friends, relatives, acquaintances, whatever, was either a Communist Party member or else was thinking about whether they should join it. Am I, do I have the spirit enough? Do I have the spunk to join the CP? That was the, that was the range of discussion. Either you were a party member, you're puzzling about whether or not you have the guts to join it. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> in that atmosphere, I guess my father was the first libertarian I knew because he was, uh, he was strongly opposed to all this. And so uh, the, uh, <clears throat> and then the spirit, I just, you know, as I, as I, I, I kept shocking them at parties or relatives. I had, I think, four, four aunts and uncles who were communist party members and another, you know, two or three or four who were pondering whether or not to join. <clears throat> so uh, that was, I got, I got more and more obnoxious to these people as I kept, kept going, attacking them and saying this is all nonsense, so forth and so on. That was my first experience in political action in my poor beleaguered family. <laughs> uh, actually, my father, as I say, my father was really my, my inspiration for this thing, so we, we got along very well. And I just an immediate nuclear family, just the rest of the people it was a problem. Um, then, uh, <clears throat> In the swanky private school which I, in which I was enrolled, everybody except, well, it was a very peculiar setup, which I don't go into great detail, but the, in New York City, the uh, rich, uh, in those days at least, uh, rich people would send their sons you know, to, to Deerfield Academy or whatever, whatever you know, out, out of town, the prep school, and the daughters being protect, specially protected were sent to New York City schools. As a result, <clears throat> the, since they, this, this particular school tried to be co-educational, uh, there were very few boys who would show up. In other words, there was a big boy shortage. Uh, and so, <clears throat> in order to get boys to, to, to attend the school and make it really co-educational, they gave a lot of scholarships to poor and middle-class young lads, including myself. So at any rate, we had, I had a spectacle of all these wealthy, extreme liberal types uh, <laughs> and uh, who would be taken, to, you know, taken back and forth to school in Rolls Royce limousines who were extreme New Dealers or Communist Party types or whatever. I would trudge you know, back and forth with crummy apartment, <laughs> increasingly individualistic and pro-capitalist. <laughs> the, uh, at any rate, the, um, as I kept dealing with these people, I got more and more pure. I was particularly interested in economics. 
Uh, and I remember in the eighth grade, I was arguing f against the capital gains tax, which Roosevelt was introducing at the time. I don't remember my arguments. I don't know if they're sound or not, but anyway, I was arguing against it. Uh, the, um, <clears throat> then um, it's true, uh, rumors have had it, and it's true that my parents both met been at an anarchist dance. This is in 1920 or something like that. Uh, I have to realize the culture of that period, and, and the, there were a lot of anarchist dances and balls and things like that. Uh, and uh, it's true, I met, they, they met there. And um, one of the, uh, I remember one of the, my father's library was one of the first books I remember reading was Elsbacher's book on anarchism, which was a very ex exotic book, which I thought was very interesting. I was not yet converted, you understand. I was only 10 or something. <laughs> At any rate, uh, but th this is not, they, they were not, well, I guess what happened was my father was an anarchist for a couple of years. Uh, then World War I arrived, and he, he found out all his friends were being arrested which they were, in opposition to the war. He, he decided it was healthier to drop out of political activity and be become a pure chemist, and which he did. <laughs> he, was a, he was the first retreatist <laughs> in the movement. Um, he felt retreatism was better than martyrdom at that point. At any rate, so he sort of lost interest in politics. And then but what happened was in, in the recession of 1938, when uh, <clears throat> after following Keynesian policies, we had a big collapse. He decided that Keynesianism or New Deal was wrong and so forth and became, a cons you know, became economically conservative. And so um, I followed right in there in that spirit. Uh, anyway, uh, and getting to uh, then, I guess what happened is my next brush with the state apparatus came in high school. <clears throat> when just as I was getting interested in the whole subject purely for sociological reasons, you understand, Miguel LaGuardia, who was an extremely beloved figure at the time, uh, <laughs> among all the left liberal establishment, Mayor Laguardia immediately uh, closed down the burlesque houses. And uh, I figured it was a personal blow, a personal affront. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> it was my first interest in civil liberties. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, you, know, you learn from experience. So <clears throat> when I got to uh, Columbia University, I found out that um, on the campus at the time, there were, I mean, first of all, you have to literally remember, realize Literally true, on the, the entire campus, there were a whole bunch of communists and communist fellow travelers, a whole bunch of social democrats, and two Republicans. <laughs> the other Republican, I was one Republican, the other Republican was an English major, we had, didn't have very much in common at the time. I wasn't really interested in literature. So that was it. <clears throat> and um, after continuing brushes at Columbia, I got more and more conservative, okay, and more and more free market oriented. In an atmosphere which was extremely, in those days, hostile to the free market. Uh, however, this, so here's a situation where I, I thought I was the only free market person in the world at that point. And uh, <clears throat> there weren't too many evidences you know, to disprove me. So when I got to graduate school, which is, I guess, 1946, 40, and 45, 46, um, all of a sudden there appeared this fantastic phenomenon. I have to realize, again, there's a huge number, huge number of people coming back from the, from, uh, from the army, a huge the graduate school was flooded. Probably the peak, peak, uh, peak number of students in all of history. You know, 500 people in the economic graduate economics class, things like that, never to be seen either before or since. And all of them were the big argument at the time was, was should you join the CP? Should you be a pro Henry Wallace or pro Harry Truman or whatever? And uh, in that spirit, <coughs> um, George Stiegler, distinguished Friedmanite economist, uh, arrived at. Columbia University campus. Uh, his first two, I remember this very vividly, his first two lectures, one was on the evils of rent control and the second was on the evils of minimum wage, at which point almost hysteria breaks out. He was almost lynched. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, this is unheard of. You have to realize that, you have to try to have an active imagination to realize this is unheard of for any, anybody with an e economist, you know, you can think, well, maybe the Hearst Press might say it, but certainly nobody of uh, academic pretensions. So I wrote, I, I wrote away for a pamphlet, an anti-rent control pamphlet, which Stiegler had mentioned, <clears throat> and thereby discovered the movement. It was my first experience in the movement. Before that, it was just me, my father, and that, that was it, as far as I knew, okay? Two-man movement. <laughs> uh, then uh, <clears throat> I discovered the Foundation for Economic Education, which in those days was the movement, and that was it. The, uh, so it was a tremendous thing for me. It was, it was like, that was the open sesame. I realized, you know, other people around, there weren't, there weren't just one person, okay? And I think they, they did a tremendous, it was a tremendous achievement on their part. Uh, they had, uh, well, that was it, it was the movement. 
people who would say the same sort of things and be interesting, and, uh, and recommend readings. Because I never read any of this stuff. You see, it was all sort of, I don't know, sort of evolved. And there were no real readings on the topic except John Stuart Mill. I mean, nobody since, say, 1848, as far as I knew. And so with, uh, with Fee, which had seminars and cocktail parties and drew, drew people together and so forth, uh, I discovered the movement. And there are marvelous, particularly marvelous, two, two marvelous people, which I want to uh, bear, pay tribute to, Frank Chodorov and uh, Bully Harper. <clears throat> the, uh, the, uh, Frank Chodorov is a fantastic person. He was a unbuttoned type in a, a three-button world <laughs> and scattering ashes everywhere and so forth and so on. It was, uh, just magnificent. And uh, <laughs> he also was very interested in discussing ideas. Many of the other people of these cocktail parties were really not. They were more agriculture oriented. I have nothing against agriculture. I love agriculture. But many of their conversations were, were confined to things like agricultural metaphors like the seed corn and and butterflies. I know nothing about either sea corn or butterflies. I've felt a little bit out of it. Uh, <laughs> uh, Chodorov, being an urban type, was not interested in sea corn. <laughs> At any rate, uh, he was a great individualist. I recommend his uh, the, the, just new book of his essays, uh, collected essays, just come out <clears throat> called Fugitive Essays. And uh, it was my first real experience in radical individualism. He was, uh, I remember it was a real shock for me. I, I arrived at the Columbia University bookstore. One, 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 one afternoon, I see a, a headline, and remember the pamphlets, and, and remember, try to remember this, the, the atmosphere of the time, all socialist, okay, to, to, the, to a man. To, and I see this pamphlet, the headline, big bull red, red letters saying, don't buy bonds. Another one saying, taxation is robbery. That was a real, that was a real shockeroo for me. Taxation, by God, it is robbery. And uh, that was my first education in political, political theory. <laughs> uh, so Chodorov had a great little magazine in Broadshe called Analysis, which he kept going, I guess, in his own meager funds, <clears throat> a, very, a very small circulation. And uh, he has magnificent radical stuff. And first of all, he was also a great writer, marvelously clear, lucid uh, writer. And, uh, and so under, this, under the auspices of reading both Chodorov and the stuff that he recommended, like Albert J. Nock, another magnificent political philosopher and a great writer, whom I hope you discover if you don't know about him yet. A marvelous book called Our Enemy the State. Another great book called Memoirs of Superfluous Man. Uh, and H.L. Mencken is my favorite writer as a style, qua writer. So it was, it took, a very short period of time, I became a pure libertarian. In other words, before that, I was sort of moving in that direction. I was a sort of a chamber of commerce type or something like that. Uh, in a very short period of time, I became a pure Minarchist, I mean, all out, radical. Um, and, you know, in favor of repudiating the debt and, and everything else. Uh, I, still was a, I still was a minarchist. I still believe that point that the government, there should be a government, but strictly confined to these you know, police and, and courts, and that was it. Uh, the, uh, the third person, of course, I want to pay tribute to is another person I met through the Foundation for Economic Education, namely my great mentor, Ludwig von Mises, whom uh, this year is uh, this year is a centennial. I said, you know, it's a really amazing thing considering Mises died very few years ago. He died almost about the same time as the centennial is coming up, and. Uh, he, uh, I met him through Fee. I heard it, I heard that he was giving lectures at New York University. At that point, I didn't, I, didn't know, I didn't know he was still alive because he wasn't mentioned in economics courses, either undergraduate or graduate, except that somebody who had tried to show that socialism couldn't work and that had been refuted 30 years before, and therefore and that was it. So, uh, and they told me he was, at Fee that he was coming out with a book that fall, big new book. I said, oh, what's well, interesting, what, what's, it, what's it about? And they said, everything. <laughs> uh, that, of course, was human action. And, uh, of course, they were right. <laughs> The, uh, so I, st I started taking Mises seminars in the fall of 49, 1949, which is the second year he was giving it. <clears throat> and two months later or so, Human Action came out. And so the combination had a synergistic effect. Um, to me, it was a real conversion experience, Human Action. I read the thing, I think, you have to realize I'd gone through all the graduate economics courses, right? And I was unhappy with all of them. I felt somehow there was something missing somewhere in the picture. 
uh, I was a free market person, but I didn't have the economic theory background. I realized that these things didn't work. I was politically in favor of it, but I didn't have the, I didn't really have a satisfactory economic theory to support this. <clears throat> and um, I felt that the Keynesians were right when they attacked the institutionalists, the institutionalists were right when they attacked the Keynesians, but I didn't see any real positive way out. And so when I read Human Action, I'd say it was a real conversion experience. I read it very fast, and it was really like reading, you know, reading a new Bible. That was it. And so uh, it was a tremendous experience. And at that point, I became an Austrian and a Misesian. <clears throat> uh, the, uh, and providing, with a satis providing us with a satisfactory economic theory, solving all the problems, such as what about monopoly or what about, uh, what about business cycles and what about this, that, and the other thing. Uh, and providing a, a firm foundation and analysis of human action itself. The, uh, <clears throat> Mises himself, another person to pay tribute to personally, just a magnificent person. Uh, when we used to, when we, before we met Mises, me and other people who were uh, p disciples or potential disciples, we were, pretty, we were quaking in our boots. I know one friend of mine, it was just a kid then, he, just, he, was going, he was still in high school, he was still a great libertarian. And, uh, <clears throat> He, he wanted to meet Mises in the worst way. He couldn't find a way, think of a way to do it. So he shows up at Mises' door, rings the doorbell, and Mises opens the door, says yes, and he says, uh, I'm selling subscriptions to the Freeman. Now this, of course, is a big joke because uh, Freeman has no subscriptions. <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I mean, you write away for it and you get it free, but he didn't know what else to say. <laughs> and he's hoped, he hoped this would start a conversational gambit, you know, when Mises would say, well, well that's it, why are you interested in the Freeman or something? Mises said, I already have it, and slams the door. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, uh, and the thing about Mises is, reason, one of the reasons why everybody's afraid to meet him is he, he is fiercely polemical, of course, in his writings, attacking all of his enemies bitterly with no, with no uh, compromise, attacking them as babblers, as <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. Uh, in person, however, just the opposite, just charming, wonderful person, uh, courteous, uh, and bringing back to us the, the first, uh, the last uh, days of pre-World War I pre Vienna, uh, <clears throat> always trying to bring out the best productivity in his students. Uh, and his students were, many of them were very dumb, many of them were packaging majors. You know, he was, he was uh, unfortunately, <laughs> He was unfortunately teaching, because, and this I will never forgive academia for. Uh, the only job he could really find was a job in, in a business school uh, where, where you know, most, of, most people were accounting majors or packaging majors, things like that. Had no interest whatsoever in what Mises was talking about, just an easy A for them. Uh, Mises didn't know anything about the American grading system. You know, in Europe, they don't grade A, B, C. So you used to give everybody A's automatically. And uh, they told him, you can't do that. Professor, you can't, you can't, oh, it's okay, he'll, he'll give automatic A's and B's, go down the list and alternate. <laughs> so, uh, so since he was an easy marker, he had a lot of fillers in, the, in this little class, and, uh, and yet he would try to, or try to think of research project, yes, yes, you should do such and such, and have an, a book on this, and, and an article on this, it was kind of, and, and, and that's pathetic, but he didn't seem to realize it. He just sailed ahead, uncomplaining, never complained about this, this situation. And uh, unfailingly cheerful, unfailingly uh, telling marvelous anecdotes about the old days in Vienna, magnificent anecdotes. And uh, generally being extremely lovable as well as, as, well as being brilliant. <clears throat> the um, one anecdote which I, I, those of you who are interested in philosophy will particularly appreciate. Uh, he was walking down the street with Max Scheler one day, it was in the 1920s. Max Scheler was a distinguished German philosopher. Uh, very much opposed, as Mises was, to logical positivism, which in those days was, big, was flourishing in Vienna. Vienna was the home of logical positivism. Uh, and uh, they're walking down the, the, the street in Vienna. You always walk, of course. a great place to walk in. He's walking down the street with Mises, and he says, tell me, Lou, why, what is there on the climate of Vienna that, that makes, creates so many logical positivists? Mises shrugs his shoulders in typical Misesian gesture. He says, well, after all, Max, in Vienna there are now three million people. <laughs> There are only 12 logical positivists, <laughs> so it can't be the climate. <laughs> the, uh, and another, another, of course, great, great thing we should always say to very hesitant students who would be afraid to speak up, because they figure he knows everything and they, don't, they know nothing. Say, so don't, don't hesitate to say anything he said, because whatever you say, regardless of how idiotic it is, has already been said before by some eminent economist. <laughs> <laughs> So that was uh, 
That was my introduction to Misesi. And we had, uh, in Mises seminar, I met people who are still my very close friends, who are uh, this, my so-called living room that begins in this period. But before that, there was no living room, just me and my father, and I got married, and that was it. And me and my wife, I guess, was, that, was the, that was the living room. And then we had, uh, then we, I found these people who were high school students, or just beginning college, um, who were Misesians, and we had these living room sessions. And we call ourselves the Circle Bastia, after, of course, Frederick Bastia. And we had about, I don't, know, I don't know how many people, maybe five hardcore people and six or seven fringe people. And that was it. <clears throat> and, we'd, and we'd sit around discussing abstract libertarian questions, such as we now, of course, are very familiar with, such as, which in those days nobody ever talked about, I mean, because that was it. We were the only libertarians I knew about. At least the only ones interested in these abstruse topics, like if, if, uh, if somebody throws a gorilla into a plate glass, plate glass window, who's, who's liable for the window? <laughs> is, it the, is the guy who throws the gorilla, is it the owner of the gorilla, or, or is it the gorilla himself? <laughs> uh, these, sort of, <laughs> these sort of burning questions <laughs> are constantly on our minds. <laughs> In those days, of course, we didn't argue about strategy. <laughs> uh, even, even people as uh, sort of flighty as we were to start discussing strategy with eight people. You know, how, how are we going to win? <laughs> we're considered too bizarre even for us. Uh, the, uh, <clears throat> So the, and the, about the same winter of 1949-50, of, of this is, I guess, two or three months later, after my conversion to Austrianism, uh, I, I became an anarchist. And I can remember exactly what happened. The, uh, it was pure logic that did it. <laughs> the, uh, I used to argue with, with two or three very close friends of mine who were liberals, who were very intelligent. <clears throat> We'd have sessions sitting around arguing constantly. Right? And we had a similar session in my house, I uh, remember that very, very vividly. And uh, we had usual arguments, about three in the morning they leave, because as many of you know, I'm a, I'm a night person. And uh, three in the morning sort of, you're just, just about average for uh, breaking up an evening. And, uh, and I'm, I thought to myself, you know, something, I, th I think something important happened tonight. What in the hell was it? And it wasn't just like the usual argument. <clears throat> and uh, I thought the thing over. I realized what it was, because one of them said at one, at one point, because uh, I was in favor of laissez-faire, I, I was a pure minicus, laissez-faire minicus, okay. And they, of course, were regular liberals. And they said, look, um, why do you favor government su supply of police force and courts? What's your justification for that? And I said something like, well, the people get together and they decide that uh, you can have this monopoly court system <clears throat> and monopoly police. And they said, I, th I think very intelligently now, they said, um, well, if the people can get together and say that, why can't the people get together and, and, and set up a steel plant and a dam and all the rest of it, right? Why can't they set up all sorts of other government industries? I thought to myself, I said, by God, they're right. <clears throat> uh, I, I came to the conclusion that laissez-faire was inconsistent. That either you had to go, go over to anarchism <clears throat> and scrap government altogether, monopoly government, coercive government altogether, or else you have to become a liberal. Of course, since it was out of the question for me to become a liberal, <laughs> Uh, that was it. That was my conversion. <laughs> um, uh, then I started reading up on this stuff, uh, anarchist writings and, and libertarian writings, etc., etc., and broadened my perspective. But that was the essential. That was, that was a tremendous winter for me. It was a winter of two, a double, double barrel conversion. First to Austrian economics and second to anarchism. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> The, uh, I remember, well, let's, well, let's see, yeah, then there's the, uh, also in Columbia Graduate School, where I still was located, of course I used to have arguments with these people all the time. Uh, at one point, <clears throat> interesting thing, thing happened, which, which stunned my, my liberal associates. They said, look, here you are an extreme right-winger, which I consider the time, extreme right-wing crazy, anarchist or whatever, and then and we'll put you, we gotta meet you up with Whitey. Whitey was the, was the, was the Communist Party leader on the campus. Uh, <laughs> He was, he was sort of a thuggish type, with turtleneck sweaters, you know, six foot eight or whatever. I mean, in that, in that stratosphere, who knows what the height is? <laughs> uh, a menacing-looking figure in general. So we got to get you together with Whitey. So they introduced me on, a, on the, they set up a meeting on the street in, on Broadway. <laughs> so, <laughs> and they figured they can get, they could get out fast. You see. 
And they introduced me formally. It was kind of sweet. They said, here, we introduce here Moran Rothbard, the outs who, oh, here's what it was, uh, Whitey, whatever his name was, who was the outstanding Marxist-Leninist on campus. And here's Murray Rothbard, who was attacking Senator Taft for having sold out to the socialists. <laughs> and then uh, they figured that would be it. Then we'd you know, pummel each other to death, and that would be <laughs> They get rid of two extremists. <laughs> and oddly enough, what happened was that the uh, Whitey said, oh, an anarchist, that's great. And so we shook hands. We had a very friendly discussion in which Whitey tried to prove to me that the way to achieve the withering away of the state is by maximizing state power. And I thought, fuck, that's a little kooky. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and the, the, my liberal friends were t totally confused. Why are these people conversing even? Why aren't they hitting each other over the head with clubs? And so that was uh, one interesting uh, ideological experience. The, uh, <clears throat> the other interesting, I think another interesting political point was the, um, this is, when was this? Yeah, about this time. Uh, I had not, of course, Libertarian Party not yet existed. So I was not yet politically pure in the sense of politically organizationally pure. And uh, the 1948 campaign, I supported Thurman for president. Thurman was the this state's rights candidate. Okay. There was a little club on Columbia University campus called uh, Students for Thurman. It was a very small club, as you might expect. <laughs> and uh, this was during the height of political act. That most of the people there on the campus were Wallace, Henry Wallace supporters. Others were uh, Truman supporters, and like, two or three Dewey supporters. And here I was, a, a, a Thurman supporter. So uh, the Students for Thurman, I remember, had one meeting, and the meeting. There are four or five members and about 12 or 13 hostile observers who are trying to find out what kind of evil racism is going to be promoted here. And most of the people who got up and spoke were sort of, you know, southern states rights types. Didn't have much to say. And I got up here as a uh, New York Jewish lad. I guess I was a passion plea for, against the central, centralized government for decentralization. I couldn't understand this at all. <laughs> anyway, the, the Students for Thermal Club did not flourish. That was my one experience with it. Uh, at any rate, the... <clears throat> Uh, we had, as I say, the, uh, about eight, six or seven people or something in this little circle of Bastia. Uh, we got along very well. I think it was a, it was a very happy times. Uh, small in number, but pure in spirit. <clears throat> uh, and arguing, as I say, about arcane matters and uh, never about strategy. <laughs> never about strategy. Uh, the, um, I remember also then about this, about this time, it was the first time in my life I ever got red baited. A big new experience for me. I mean, now those of you who think I'm a commie now, it's nothing to it. But <laughs> the uh, I consider myself an extreme right winger. Okay, this is the the old right. The re Republicans or the right wingers were semi-libertarian in those days. They were anti-military intervention. They were anti-conscription. They were favor the free market. And uh, so I consider myself sort of extreme version of this. Okay, so uh, I wrote a I wrote a column for obscure little magazine called Faith and Freedom which uh, nobody's ever heard of, I'm sure, here. And uh, <laughs> was, was, written, was, was written, it was a very good, actually very good libertarian magazine for its day. It was written for right-wing Protestant ministers. That was the market that they were writing for. And people were writing it. <laughs> it was a sort of a culture clash. <laughs> and uh, the, uh, so I, I wrote the Washington column. I succeeded Chodorov, one of my proud moments is when Chodorov left Washington column. I became the Washington columnist, even though I'd never been to Washington at that point. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and I wrote it under a pseudonym called Aubrey, Aubrey Herbert, and for various obscure reasons, which I need not go into, unimportant reasons. At any rate, the, um, I started, I, I, this was the beginning of the Eisenhower administration. So I had a lot of fun attacking what sorts of status plans in the Eisenhower administration, attacking the idea that we should spend every American drop of American blood supporting Chiang Kai-shek and things like that. I was having a ball. And the editor comes flying to the East. He's before that, six months before he said I was doing a great job, great writer and all that. He comes to the East and I say, he says, I have to fire you. I said, why do you have to fire me? I thought you liked, that's not the point. He said, my, our, our constituents are, are writing letters calling you a communist. These are the right-wing Protestant ministers. <laughs> So I was kind of stunned. It's the first time I've ever been red baited. I'm now, of course, used to it. It's made much, much difference. But it was, a, it was a culture shock. So at any rate, I said, this, but since I always I spent all the time attacking the government, how can I be a communist? Since communists are in favor of your all out government ownership of everything. But the uh, logic was lost on the editor because he was just interested in his constituents. Fortunately or unfortunately, retribution, divine retribution struck, and the magazine folded about three months later. <laughs> <laughs> the um, well, I guess the uh, Let's see, which brings me up to about late, middle or late 1950s. Uh, 
Let's see, what's... Oh, I guess I should... Well, okay, the... Well, the fit, late 50s, uh, they say, the, before that, it was essentially, those of us who were libertarians, again, I guess it was about five or six or eight or whatever, considered ourselves extreme right-wingers during this, in this spectrum of context. Uh, then what happened was the right wing was taken over and changed dramatically by National Review, 1955. <clears throat> uh, and for various reasons, one, because it was a power vacuum, because the old leaders had died off, like Taft and Colonel McCormick, <clears throat> um, it was easy for the National Review to take over and sort of change the whole picture into what the right wing is now. The right wing in those days was not theocratic, it was not pro-war, pro-conscription. So anyway, the, the, the face of the whole right wing was changed, at which point those of us who had considered ourselves extreme right wingers had to start leaving the movement, leaving the right wing movement. And uh, it was a, a painful break, as, as usually, these things usually are. Uh, the, uh, I was writing, I, write, I wrote quite a few economic uh, articles and book reviews for National Review the first few years. The, um, I was pretty appalled by, the, by, the new, by, by those days with the new right. And uh, split with them about 1959 or something, about, I guess about that period. The, uh, my, be my best friend there was Frank Meyer, he was a very interesting character. He was the, the book review editor and general theoretician for National Review, now, now dead. Uh, another very, very charming chap, he was extremely erudite. <coughs> Uh, intellectually exciting, libertarian in many ways. He was great on the public school system, hated the guts of the public school system, even hated private schools. <laughs> <laughs> and as a result, he raised his kids himself, and which is a heroic act, as probably many of you would you know, realize. <clears throat> the, um, and he's pretty good on most things. So he was, unfortunately, he was weak on one particular topic, namely nuclear war. He was all in favor of it. <laughs> The, uh, to give you sort of a feel of what National Review was in those days, it probably still is, but I haven't had any contact with him in a long time. The, uh, Frank and his wife, Elsie, were also a very charming person. The two of them used to argue bitterly about what the foreign policy move should be. Okay? Frank was in favor of immediate nuclear attack on the Soviet Union. Okay? Elsie wanted to give them 24 hours to resign before we attacked them. <laughs> that, was the, uh, that was the matrix. <laughs> Of, uh, of a, a spectrum of opinion on the, extreme, on the right wing, on the new right. So we didn't, uh, we did not politically see eye to eye, obviously, for a long time. <laughs> for, after the first few, few years, when I found out what was going on. The other thing that struck me about the, the, the new right was the monarchistic aspect. Uh, I remember many, many sessions or cocktail parties, and the big argument would be something like this. Should the Bourbon monarchy be restored first or the Habsburgs? <laughs> so... Uh, so that's the sort of thing I can relate very well to. It was even worse than agricultural metaphors. <laughs> uh, the, uh, so the, the, what happened was after the small growth in the 40s, in other words, after finding the movement uh, in the mid, middle of the late 40s, and then sort of having sort of intellectual companions, whatever, in the late 50s, we're back in square one again, more or less, by 1959 or 60. Also, the libertarians in that period were beginning were swinging in a pro-war direction, also wherever they were, mostly were swinging in a pro-war direction. Uh, <clears throat> one of my close friends who was an original member of the Circle of Bosnia, Robert Shuckman, who died a tragic death very early, was probably was the first chairman of the Young Americans for Freedom. <clears throat> uh, to give you an example <coughs> of Yaf's spirit in those days, it probably still, still is, the... Um, the, sh the founding meeting in Sharon, Connecticut of YAF, okay, uh, the, 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 there was a small libertarian contingent. This was the beginning of the Libertarian Conservative Alliance. Not, not, not me, but the other, other people. Uh, and the, they suggested the term the young, young, Americans, young Americans for Freedom. The trads, who were really the majority, traditionalists, said, no, no, we can't use the word freedom because it's a, it's a commie word. <laughs> uh, to me, it sort of symbolizes the right wing from then on. Freedom is a commie word. <laughs> Okay. But uh, Shuckman was able to prevail I guess, with some of the cooler heads like Buckley and the, the, uh, <laughs> get the thing started. Uh, the, uh, so we had a situation and by the early 60s, I had to start battling on the, on the foreign policy front both you know, with, with, with libertarians as well as other people. And, uh, and there was, uh, when the Vietnam War started and the draft, of course, this made the thing much more intense, the whole problem. And, uh, and Leonard Liggio and myself, founder of Left and Right, which uh, try, I guess three times a year publication, I don't even know how to say it, 
triannual, triannual whatever. And uh, we figured nobody was reading it. I mean, we, just couldn't, we had some subscribers. Unfortunately, we were so ill-organized that no, we never cashed anybody's check. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> the, uh, <clears throat> at any rate, as a result, we had a heavy deficit, as you can imagine. <laughs> Uh, but we, we figured nobody was reading it. It turned out later, after the, after the magazine died, a lot of people seemed to have been influenced by it. But uh, that was, that's the sort of thing that happens in writing. It's sort of, writing is sort of like putting, your, putting a note on a bottle and putting it on the ocean and hoping somebody reads it someday. So uh, it would be very surprising to find out a lot of people have read it. The, uh, so with, the, uh, so with, the, with the, this position of being anti-war and anti-draft, uh, Certainly on the war question, a position which split us totally from the right-wingers, who then again accused us of being commies for the second and not the last time. Uh, we suddenly, then, then we suddenly, then we really arrive at the famous YAF split. In other words, we get to the point in 69, I guess it was. Uh, all of a sudden, libertarian types pop up at YAF, and you will hear, I'm sure, at the SIL, SIL party, uh, more discussion of this. The... Uh, <clears throat> And I wasn't really close to that because the, the YAF split happened in St. Louis where I wasn't, I wasn't an app. I, I did contribute to the split by writing an inflammatory uh, four-page article in Libertarian Forum, which I just found out in 69 to replace left and right, um, saying, listen, YAF, urging them all, calling upon the splitless evil organization. It finally has, <laughs> uh, once again, blowing my cool, but it seemed to have a certain amount of effect. <laughs> The, uh, at any rate, the, uh, uh, apparently YAF was split, of course, so the big issue being the draft, the conservatives or the trads at the, at the YAF convention uh, being horrified and appalled when one of our people, one of the Libertarian Caucus people in YAF, burned his draft card openly, at which point... <laughs> uh, <laughs> at which point they tried to lynch him. And, uh, <laughs> Another, another, another thing is our people at St. Louis were, were shouting laissez-faire, laissez-faire as they're, while they were burning the draft card, and the opposition, the trads were shouting lazy fairies, and uh, which you can, again, shows the mentality of these people. <clears throat> so, uh, <clears throat> with the meantime, in the Libertarian Forum had been founded, one, because left and right was running too many deficits, and two, because uh, we figure that with the Nixon administration coming to power, and this has certain parallels right now, of course, uh, many libertarians at the time thought that Nixon was going to be the savior. He was going to bring liberty to America. Uh, I, I swear it's true. Uh, I have many, several friends of mine who have by this time become Nixon advisors were claiming Nixon is really a libertarian. As a matter of fact, some of them said Nixon was really an anarchist. I get that. <laughs> they said, Nixon's one of us. You'll see when, he might now, of course, when he, because he's a politician, he's running for office. He has to pretend he's a you know, left wing and statist and all that. But, but you'll see, boy, when he gets in the office, you'll see what he'll, what he'll be. He'll, you know, take off the gloves, <laughs> come out of the closet. Of course, we did see to our deep, deep regret. But uh, this, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I, I coined a little quip at that point. Nixon had, was one of the pioneers in the idea of having special interest groups for Nixon, like writers for Nixon, housewives for Nixon, et cetera, et cetera. So I wrote a thing saying there should be a group called Anarchists for Nixon. <laughs> <laughs> uh, at any rate, the, uh, there was, I guess, quick disillusionment with that. But uh, we founded the Libertarian Forum largely because my publisher and close friend Joe Peden believed that we should have a voice pouring out of the public, whoever reads it among the Libertarian public, pointing out that Nixon is not really a Libertarian, goddammit. <laughs> and uh, that's really how it got started. The, um, while about the same time the AF split was going on, we, we started um, supper clubs. New York, Libertarian Supper Club. There is now a Libertarian Supper Club, which is very successful and peaceful. Uh, our Supper Club was peaceful, it was successful, but not very peaceful. <laughs> the, um, this was during the Nixon repression period. <clears throat> okay, so we, we, we figured out that the meetings in my living room were get, getting a little too large. I have a pretty small living room. This living room is legendary, but it's small. Okay. So uh, we decided, why don't we have a Supper Club? We have a, hire a Chinese restaurant or something, nice, something nice and cheap. <clears throat> and have a meeting and just announce it and have somebody reading a paper, you know, whatever, some short thing, having a discussion. So we did that. We, we, we met in a Chinese restaurant, well, a seedy but very good Chinese restaurant on Broadway and 100th Street, 103rd Street, something like that. And um, 
we, had, we thought we'd get about 30 people, right? We got, we got about 80. This is the beginning of the sort of big libertarian growth. Where did these 80 people come from? Who the hell are they? Well, some of them, unfortunately, were police agents, at least one. <laughs> Uh, because what happened was that the, and these, these, you have to realize these meetings were extremely innocuous, right? I mean, uh, my friend Leonard Liggio gave a paper on the history of classical liberalism, okay? The next morning, this is Saturday night, the next morning we had a contact, we had one student group at that time at Fordham University, it was our big student libertarian group, one and only, maybe it was another, another one somewhere. And uh, the, the people at Fordham knew the head of YAF, it's New York State YAF at the time, it was very friendly in Fordham campus. So Saturday night, Len Liggio gave a little talk on the history of classical liberalism. Okay. Sunday morning, the, 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 the YAF guy would call up my friends at Fordham and say, here's, here's what happened last night. Len Liggio gave a paper, the following people attended it, and they reeled off a list of attendees. He got that from his police spies, who would, he was friendly with New York City Police Department. So uh, that was a sort of atmosphere. Now, they didn't do anything, particularly at the point, but uh, I guess we felt we were on the cutting edge of the revolution. <laughs> uh, then we, we decided we, the, supper, the supper clubs were fairly successful, we're getting 80 people. We, we did something very daring, and if I turn on retrospect, it'd be pretty crazy. And we issued a call, okay, a libertarian forum. Uh, come one, come all, first libertarian convention. This was Columbus Day, 1969. Everybody show up for this mammoth thing. Okay? <clears throat> we expected we'd get about 200 people. We got about, I don't know, 400 or something like that. Are we, who, who are these people? Never saw them before. Usually never saw them later either. Uh, it's very strange. The whole thing is very strange. Really, this was phantasmagoric because, first of all, we held this thing in a, a notorious Kami hangout, Kami Hotel in Times Square. The reason why we went there is it was the cheapest hotel we could find. This is not, we're not the affluent movement we now are, right? This is the old, <laughs> this is the old days. So there's a place called the Hotel Diplomat, which uh, has very cheap meeting rooms, et cetera. So uh, we, we, we had these scholarly papers and everything, stuff like that. Then we found things, peculiar things were happening. Like all of a sudden somebody would pop, we'd stand outside, somebody would pop up with a flashbulb and take our picture. Or somebody would swagger up and say, uh, with a sort of obvious shoulder host, holster bulge with a crew cut. Are you one of those anarchists in there? And we'd say, anarchists? Who's that? We've well, never heard of it. We're just standing here going to a restaurant. <laughs> so <laughs> anyway, that was the, uh, that was the uh, <laughs> situation where it was a sort of a, almost a police bust. Uh, they didn't quite get to it, but uh, it was uh, sort of close to it. Also, the people there were kind of, we never saw these people. It was a very strange and motley group. Uh, don't forget, we were used to eight people in the living room with 20 people. <clears throat> Here we find a tremendous spectrum of libertarian variety, ranging from people walking around with capes with dollar signs on them, to, uh, <laughs> to, uh, to people with black armbands, rather weird looking types with black armbands, and who keep constantly shouting, kill, loot. <laughs> so, so, uh, was that a close meeting of the minds in this, uh, this convention? It probably turned off more people, it set back the movement <laughs> quite a few years, I think. <laughs> At any rate, that was the, that was the, where we had to learn through experience and all that. Obviously, it was a, the uh, <laughs> essential learning process. So we now, we've now come, uh, I guess, uh, to uh, the early days, 1970, this is 69, a year or two later. I guess I should talk about the first publicity of the movement. Uh, what happened is that the 19, the fall of 1970, Okay, the campus revolt was taking place in 69 and 70, basically. All the burnings of the camp, buildings, whatever. By the fall of 70, the whole thing had died out very, very fast. Okay. So New York Times was looking around for some, something to write about. <clears throat> and they went to the campus. They couldn't find any political activity. They went to Columbia University the, the year or two before the heartland of uh, sit-ins and burnings and all that. Couldn't find any, any, any political activity at all, except one peculiar group called the Freedom Conspiracy. Who are these people? Never heard of them before. Uh, Freedom Conspiracy is the only pol active political group on campus since 1970. They were in favor of Jim Buckley for Senate, a deviation which fortunately has now been corrected. <laughs> and uh, they're a weird group because they, on one hand they're talking all this stuff about laissez-faire and free market, and they're also very counterculture types. And the things with the black flags and so forth and so on, long hair and all the rest of it. So the New York Times felt this was a very you know, interesting phenomenon. They wrote a little article about it. And then uh, two or three months later, the New York Times Magazine section, which was extremely influential in the media and general, you know, general 
opinion groups, uh, wrote a front page article, this is the early 1971, uh, with a picture of these guys, the, the two leaders, Stan Lear and Lou Rosetto, uh, with a black flag and whatever, and anarchy written on the back and so forth and so on, and a long lead article on this strange new group called Libertarians, and they're, they're in favor of uh, John Locke, and, <laughs> and so forth and so on. And this is the first time, I think, the modern libertarian movement got any kind of media publicity, <clears throat> and it kicked things off, because then there was op-ed pieces about it, and uh, what happened then was that uh, they asked me to write something about it, and I got an argument with Buckley, as usual, and uh, from that, they asked me to write Four New Liberties. The whole thing begins to snowball, and of course, about that year, uh, so later that year, the Libertarian Party was founded. So uh, I think, since you're all, of course, familiar with the history of the party, you'll hear much more about it from the founding members who were really here in person in Colorado. I'll end my reminiscences and nostalgia at this point, <laughs> as we've now brought up to the modern current period, and uh, brought you from the antediluvian period of my birth all the way up. <laughs> All the way up to uh, modern times. So thank you very much. <laughs>
a present. Good heavens. That's very sweet. Fantastic. It's great. An homage to Murray from the Brazilian Libertarians. And here is their magazine with a picture of Murray. And obviously, some of his writings are an article about him in a language that I don't know. <laughs> Next. There. Ah, the orthodox position. <laughs> you want to repeat it? Yeah. The question is what is the orthodox Rothbard position on patents and copyright? Uh, the orthodox position is, this, uh, oddly enough, the same position as Henry George. Uh, the only one I could find that had the same viewpoint. Namely, copyright's good, patent's bad. Uh, the reason for that is not, as you might think, is that I'm a writer and therefore pro-copyrights. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the easy uh, economic determinist argument. Uh, it's really, it's because uh, uh, a, copy, a copyright is a common law device which says if you, you invent something or write something, it doesn't really make any difference. You can copyright an industrial design, for example, right now. Uh, what it says is that if you, um, you, 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 put, you stamp on it, whatever it is, whether it's an invention or a book or whatever, you stamp on a copyright, which means that you're selling it, you're selling the full ownership of it, except you're keeping, you're reserving something. You, you, you can chop up property rights in different parts, of course. You're keeping to yourself the exclusive right to sell it, to resell it or anything identical to it. So that's the copyright, which is perfectly legitimate. <clears throat> the problem with a patent is the government steps in and says, you have the exclusive right to this invention, and nobody else can use it, even if he's invented something 3,000 miles away completely, completely independently of it. In other words, a patent is a monopoly privilege uh, repressing people's right to do whatever they want to with their own property. So, and there are, of course, many, in the history of inventions, there are lots of independent inventions. It's the way you know, things are in the air, like five or six people invented a telephone about the same time, and Bell raced, outraced them to the patent office which is responsible for, you know, for AT&T, because Bell got the exclusive monopoly on every, any telephone. <clears throat> so uh, this is really illegitimate. So the, the, uh, for that reason, in other words, with copyright, you have to prove a guy had access. If, if somebody has a similar telephone, let's say, you copyright a telephone, somebody else comes up with a telephone 500 miles away, you have to prove the guy had access to your phone. With a patent, you don't have to do that. You just, you have the thing and that's it. So that's the, that's the orthodox line on that. <laughs> Murray? Um, when you were talking about the early New York years, you didn't mention the attack on Fort Dix, and I thought you might like to uh, tell that story. Okay. Yeah, that was at the uh, <laughs> that was at the uh, this, this 1969 convention or whatever you want to call it. <clears throat> um, the uh, we had but this thing was very supposed to be very scholarly. We had planned this for a long time. It's going to be the first Libertarian Scholars Conference. Basically, we, we now have a Libertarian Scholars Conference every year, but. That was the first planned one. We had papers and things, you know, panels and all the rest of it. And uh, what happened was that the uh, Saturday night, we started, I guess, Friday night. <clears throat> and uh, Saturday night, we had a contingent which said, actually it was Carl Hess who was here, here this week, uh, said that, uh, <laughs> the heck with this you know, intellectual stuff, let's go and, and attack Fort Dix. Uh, <laughs> The, uh, there was a movement on to, 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 to invade Fort Dix, and uh, I was, you know, it's not that I was against the theory of it. <laughs> I felt it was premature. <laughs> and also, we had a scholars thing planned, you see, and so, uh, and it wasn't on the agenda. But anyway, so we had a big split. <laughs> we had a big split in the, uh, the, in the movement that night, and which I, I guess about half the people marched on Fort Dix, and the other half stayed with the scholars conference. And uh, what happened was that Sunday, the March of Fort Dix occurred. Um, the lady who was the head of the Michigan contingent, who in the, in the whole history of the libertarian movement, she was probably the wackiest person I've ever met. That's saying a hell of a lot. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> she, uh, <laughs> she, her whole contingent came with the black armbands and so forth. And the, so the, she came stomping back from Fort Dix, uh, 
marching down the hall, seizing the microphone from a genteel discussion of patents and copyrights, whatever it was. And started cursing us out, no uncertain terms. Uh, you SOBs, et cetera, et cetera, how dare you sit here while we're being gassed at Fort Dix. Of course, they were gassed, obviously, from the, as one might have expected. So uh, that, uh, I guess that's, that's about it. <laughs> Murray? <laughs> yeah. I'd like to, I'd like to uh, hear the origin of the Rothbardian pension for bow ties. Uh, OK, it's very, it's very simple. Uh, I, I, have to, I have to admit that in my early days, I was wearing regular plunky ties. And, uh, <laughs> and when I got married, my wife decided I looked much better in bow ties. And that was it. That was the end of the. <laughs> <laughs> Over there? Yes, uh, Murray, how do you feel that the founding of the Libertarian International is going to affect the future of international libertarianism? I don't know. There is a Libertarian International being founded. Uh, it's meeting like this first, first time next summer in Inter Interlaken in uh, Switzerland. And uh, well, it should be great. I, I, it's hard to know. I don't really, I'm not really in touch with the European movements. But uh, there are, there, I know there are, <clears throat> I just met a few Norwegian libertarians I've never heard of before. Very good people, and uh, there's a whole Icelandic libertarian movement. Apparently, there's a there's a there's a Austrian a Misesian Austrian professor of economics who've been totally isolated. Imagine how you isolate in Iceland, right? I mean, you isolate New York is one thing, but isolated in, in Iceland is really something else. And have been carrying on the torch for 25 years or so, and then there's now an Icelandic movement. Unfortunately, most of us can't read Icelandic or cut off from this. So this. The Libertarian International will be, will be an opportunity to meet these people, for one thing, and find interchange views and so forth. And it should be great. I, I don't know how many people will show up at the first meeting, but it's, you know, I guess you have to try and find out. At, uh, first, the beginning of a liberal turn. <laughs> yes. Another present for Would you like to say something about this present? Yeah. This is this is a, a present from the people in Park County. And fi this is Phil Prosser. How you do? Um, <laughs> people in of the Park County Libertarian Party have published a free enterprise calendar honoring those people who have made the industrial and political revolution in the last 300 years rather than uh, politicians and generals. And we'd like to present this copy to Murray Rothbard for his pioneering efforts on behalf of libertarianism. Murray's getting all these new toys. Yeah. <laughs> Who else has a question, a comment, more presents? <laughs> Over there? I was just wondering how you would feel about uh, when we finally get elected and get to disband this government as much as we'd like to, would you favor keeping some of NASA as a defense measure, strictly not to put nuclear weapons in orbit, but as surveillance satellites and an early warning system? Or would you rather see NASA totally disbanded and allow free enterprise to yeah, just take over space? And free enterprise taking over space all the way. <laughs> <laughs> That's an easy, easy one. <laughs> that seems like it's the best mic over there. OK. I hope I'm not missing somebody over there, but the lights are kind of obscuring my vision. So. You might have to speak up. Is there somebody behind that mic? This mic? Yeah. OK. <laughs> <laughs> I understand that Murray has still not related the story of the free market lighthouse at the Columbia Conference in 1971. And I think that is a story that bears repeating. Uh, yes, let me see. The, uh, that was the, you know, this, the, that was the uh, Columbia University one, right, conference? Uh, yeah, there was a whole thing. I've, I've had a, a series of jousts with Bill Buckley over the years. Uh, usually what happens is if he thinks we're getting stronger at all, we're getting any publicity, then he attacks me. And then 10 years later, the same sort of thing happened. He attacks me again. So it's, uh, 
the degree of effectiveness is, uh, you know, depend on the degree of attack. At any rate, uh, one time he said that, uh, well, these libertarians, uh, they can uh, sit around their busy little seminars worrying about denationalizing lighthouses, whereas we, you know, we conservatives are out there defending America from the communist hordes. So uh, the, uh, I answered him that I was more interested in foreign policy than I was in denationalizing lighthouses, actually, <laughs> strange as it might seem. And of course, I was you know, opposing his view of it. As my friend Ronald Hemingway wrote, uh, he refuses to thank Mr. Buckley for saving his life. <laughs> uh, the, so at any rate, at the Columbia University conference, a very sweet gesture, I was presented with a lighthouse as a, a symbol of so-called impractical purist libertarianism. That was, I think, this is our, as I remember it. Fill me in more on it. So the lighthouse is sort of the sim symbol. Murray, you weren't initially a supporter of the LP. What got you to join? What turned you positive on it? Well, I wasn't, I wasn't, I was, I was against it. Look, what happened, well, I'll tell you very frankly what happened. You have to remember, there was no, nobody ever heard of a Libertarian Party, right? As far as I knew, there were still only about eight Libertarians in the country. And uh, I suddenly get a call one night from somebody from Colorado, okay, saying, uh, We'd like, to offer you the, we'd like to offer you the nomination for President of the United States. <laughs> but, so I figured it was another libertarian nut and hung up. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> the, uh, so I, I just didn't take it, the idea seriously at all. I, I thought there were so few people. How can you talk about running for president? And uh, I was wrong. And, when, and obviously, the idea caught on. It was, extreme, it was a tremendous tactical strategic success. And so about a year later, I joined the party. I joined the party after my first uh, uh, attendance of the, of the FLP convention, New York LP convention. I was so impressed with the people there. I thought, well, that's it. So uh, I've been here ever since. He obviously believes in it now since he's accepted the title of Mr. Libertarianism. <laughs> Jack, were you there? Yes. Murray, you could probably clear up an area of doctrine that's been bothering me. Yeah. I was told at one time, and I don't know if this is apocryphal or not, that you were in favor of the U.S. and Russia negotiating to get rid of nuclear arms. Yeah, sure. And then I thought, well, that's nice. The two governments get rid of nuclear arms, but maybe private people will still continue to own them because as libertarians, mm. I don't think we take them away. Yeah. And then I was thinking of Leonid Brezhnev with his nuclear arms, <laughs> and I wasn't feeling very safe, and I thought of Exxon with theirs, and I wasn't feeling very safe, mm. and I wondered what the position really is on this. There's no, uh, there's no canonical position on that yet. <laughs> <laughs> The, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tricky area. The, within the spectrum of the libertarian movement, as far as I know, there's every, every view on it. Uh, some friends of mine believe that uh, nuclear wep private nuclear, we nuclear weapons should be illegal because they're per se aggressive. In other words, the very holding of them means you're threatening somebody. Others, other, some of the science, science people, uh, believe every man should have his own, every man and woman should have his own laser beam and, and, and missile, a nuclear missile. Uh, I'm sort of in the middle of the road on that, as I am in almost everything else. <laughs> the, uh, I kind of, my view is that it should be legal, but I would, I would sort of be very wary about anybody who had one and sort of organize, <laughs> and organize a boycott, you know, don't trade with uh, some, this guys building a nuclear missile and something like that. But I, I don't think, as I say, it really needs a lot of discussion. It really does. Are you in favor of the two governments negotiating to for them as governments to take away their nuclear weapons, oh, yeah. whether or not other people Oh, sure. Have them. Oh, sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, yeah, the question is that uh, the Reagan administration seems to be paranoid about the Russian threat against the for invading the United States and would I comment on the Russians' economic ability to wage war? Uh, I don't really think they believe the Russians will invade the United States. I don't think even they believe that. Uh, I think what they want to do is to keep American hegemony over the, all the rest of the world <clears throat> so that 
what they worried about as a possible Russian invasion of Western Europe or Persian Gulf or Afghanistan or whatever. Uh, it's too bizarre to think they actually invade the United States. The, uh, <clears throat> their ability is pretty, was pretty miserable and getting worse all the time. They, they, can't even, they can't even handle Poland, for heaven's sake. I mean, they, they're the communist empire is cracking up. It's one of the great, it's one of the great under, in a sense, under sold stories of the 20th century. The fact they had a, a, a Russian empire, communist empire, which was monolithic in the days of Stalin, where the Kremlin gave the orders, everybody jumped from, from New York to, uh, you know, to uh, China. And we now have a situation where most of the communist parties are split off, or China and Russia are almost at war, where, as a matter of fact, Russia is more, much more paranoid about China than they are about the United States. They're scared stiff of China. And, uh, and they can't even keep Poland. Poland is extremely important to them because Poland is the gateway to the Eastern Europe, and it's between them and, and East Germany. And so the fact that it didn't, they didn't feel they had the guts to invade Poland, I think, shows they're really, they're really in bad shape. And, uh, the talk, and the peculiar thing, the ironic part of this whole thing, that in the last 40 years, Russia is now in its weakest position, economically, militarily, geographically, whatever, and yet we're now we've revived the whole Cold War nonsense about an imminent Russian threat and the bomb shelters and missiles are coming and all the rest of it. Somebody hiding behind the lights over there. Murray, I'd like to uh, ask you what you think is the best book for a comprehensive introduction to Austrian economics. Uh, this is uh, what, what sort of level? Introductory level? Pr pr something uh, primer level? Something appropriate to college study. That's the trouble is there's no really one book that you can say is a, is a textbook introduction to Austrian economics. There's a there's some good elementary stuff like Bovey's Essentials of Economics, but it's really much lower level. Uh, and there's some very good books, you know, monographs on different topics. Uh, yeah, that's not really a textbook type, though. <laughs> textbook type book. Yeah, I would recommend Man Economy and State in a pinch. <laughs> in other words, no, it's, it's, it's difficult. It's a, maybe O'Driscoll's book on Hayek might be a good introduction. It's, it's, it's the, nothing really, unfortunately, nothing has really hit the. See, the trouble is. No, there's no incentive to write a college textbook in Austrian economics because nobody would adopt it, or very few colleges would adopt it. And so very few publishers would publish something which only get three adoptions, and very few writers would bother doing it. So that's, we have to break through that vicious circle, and which will, I think, happen in time because Austrian economics is growing all the time. Uh, eventually, you get a point where somebody will sit down and write a textbook, and that will be it. But I could recommend things in you know, specific areas. But. Murray, did you have any involvement with the anti-war and peace movement of the 60s? Uh, did you or any of the people and your friends have any involvement yeah, with it? Yeah, well, I was, yeah, I was, I was involved to some extent. I was more, in the, uh, I was um, the, um, let's see, there was, I, the question is, was I involved in the anti-war movement of the 60s? Uh, there was a free university of New York, which has opened up about that period. First couple of years of which was quite good, and very good lecturers, top experts. Uh, all anti-war, many of them Marxists, not all. And uh, that was pretty enjoyable. I didn't, you know, some of the speakers there and so forth. Um, the, as far as activism goes, not too much. I did write stuff, I did write inflammatory literature, which caused uh, my big, biggest success at that point. There were two student groups, I think, two student libertarian groups in the country. One was at Fordham, which I mentioned already. The other was the University of Kansas. Uh, University of Kansas had a YAF chapter, yeah, which was libertarian. After reading Libertarian Forum, they all shifted and joined Students for Democratic Society, the whole chapter. <laughs> it's kind of a shocker for them. Uh, so that, that happened. I, I wasn't really m m more involved. I knew, uh, I got to know a lot of the new left revisionist historians, like Ron Radosh and James Weinstein. But other people were much more involved. And Leonard Liggio was much more active at that point in the actual organizational stuff than I was. Tony? Uh, I've just been asked if, uh, before I give my question, if you'd make a request to the people in the back of the room to keep it down. We, we're having a hard time listening. If they could have heard you, that would have been enough. Uh, would the people in the back of the room try to keep their voices low or move into other areas that aren't going to interfere with the people here hearing Murray? Did you hear me? Thanks. <laughs> Emmerling is telling me I'm a pushy broad. <laughs> okay, Tony, it's all quiet for you. Um, 
Murray, I just wondered if uh, you thought that the Gold Commission was going to recommend a return to the gold standard. And if so, would you tell me what you think the price of gold will be? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, they're not going to recommend a commission, <laughs> a gold standard. Uh, the Gold Commission was uh, mandated by the Congress in the last days of the Carter administration when some writer to some bill, appropriation bill. Uh, the president was therefore mandated legally to appoint a, a commission to investigate return of the gold standard. Uh, Reagan finally did it after about six months of, of tremendous pressure. After all, it's le you have to do it, right? It's illegal not to. So he finally appointed one, I think, about June. Uh, there are 18, 17 or 18 members of the commission, of which 14 or 15 are dedicated, or maybe slightly less, are dedicated fanatical anti-gold people. Uh, most of them are monetarists. Most of them are either from the Treasury Department or the Federal Reserve Board. Uh, there are, however, a couple of very good gold, pro-gold people on it. Ron Paul, particularly, who's on the Gold Commission, and uh, Representative Republican of Texas, and Lou Lehrman of Lehrman Institute. So uh, what they're planning to do, I think, is write a minority report Majority report will be the usual Freemanite baloney. Okay, uh, the minority report should be, I hope, a scholarly, bang up, you know, his historical, theoretical, and political justification for the gold standard, which I hope will get a lot of publicity and influence. Uh, so that's, you know, that's basically what's going to happen. The Gold Commission, for example, mandated uh, the original Gold Commission plan was the report would be in by October. Although they only got set up in July, and they have only three meetings. So they got, I think we got it extended to January, but, still, but that's basically it. It would be just about time enough to write a minority report. Uh, what the price of gold would be if we really had a good setup, if we really had a good gold commission? I'm not sure. It would have to be studied. It would be something like $1,500 to $2,000 an ounce, something like that. But, you know, that, would, that, needs, that, needs, that would need a lot of work, but around that. What are your views on abortion and children's rights? Huh. We, just, we just passed a very good platform, two platform planks on the topic, uh, which I agree with 100%. I, I sum up um, on abortion, I'm 1,000% in favor of everybody's right to own his or her own body, which implies the right of terminating pregnancy. Uh, so I'm very much in favor of the right to have an abortion. I'm, I'm, I, I'm obviously not pro-abortion in the sense I think everybody should have an abortion, <laughs> okay? I don't think there anybody, there's anybody in that camp. I'm pro-choice, pro-ownership of one's body. Um, on, um, on children's rights, I'm in favor of uh, basically uh, the children have the right not to be molested, attacked, mutilated, etc., and have the right to get, get, to get out. I think that's the key, the right to run, to run away or to contract out with some other foster parent. That, I think, would solve a lot of the whole problem. I recommend the two planks, the two platform planks on that. Over on this mic. Yeah, Murray, you mentioned uh, in passing that it appeared to you the Soviet hegemony was uh, breaking up. Right. Uh, but, you know, some might hold that makes them all the more dangerous and that they're going to have to resort to more drastic measures to defend the uh, Soviet regime. <clears throat> So I'd like to know how you stand on that in the light of uh, an anarch anarchist stand on who ought, you know, how armed forces ought to be organized, and also how you stand on the question of unilateral disarmament. Well, yeah, uh, I, don't, I, I don't understand that con the, the, the argument. I don't understand the argument that the weaker you are, the more widely you are to attack. I, just, I, think, I think that's just bonkers. Uh, that, the variant of that, by the way, which has now dropped, fortunately dropped out of discussion, the so-called thirsty bear theory, which was very popular around the spring of this year, winter and spring, which has now unfortunately died out. The thirsty bear theory was that Russia is short of oil. And therefore, since they haven't gotten much oil, they have to, go, they have to invade the Persian Gulf to get it. Uh, there are many things wrong with this theory, namely one that they, they could buy the oil. They don't have to invade it, <laughs> they don't have to invade the Persian Gulf. Uh, and secondly, then it turns out the CIA just recently come out with a report saying, shucks, I guess they do, they don't, they're not short of oil. Uh, they got plenty of oil in Russia, so the thirsty bear theory is now shot. I just, I just, I just don't understand that argument. I think it's bonkers. I don't know of any, any, any state in the history of the world which acted on that kind of ba basis. Uh, on uh, now, what was the other part of your question? Yeah, there was something before that. Um, Russia and something. Yeah, well, that, no, that I think I've answered. Anyway, on disarmament. Um, 
the, uh, we've, we've passed the pro-unilateral disarmament plank today. The, uh, the, I think it's a very intelligent plank. What it says is we're in favor of, of unilateral disarmament. Not pending that, not being able to get it, we favor the following thing, joint mutual disarmament, uh, no, no, no nuclear strike, first nuclear strike pledge, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's a little bit like the taxation plank and that sort of structure. Uh, the reason why I haven't been advocating unilateral disarmament fiercely for many years is I am convinced that we could get joint disarmament very easily. In other words, there's not much point of having unilateral disarmament if you can easily get mutual joint disarmament. It's kind of, you know, it's, so that's, that's the only reason I've not advocated this uh, you know, thoroughly for a long time. But I think the basic, the basic problem is, the bottom line is the nuclear weapons are the, the big threat to the, human, the survival of the human race. I mean, just as, as, as simple as all that. It's mass slaughter, and mass slaughter is the, the big thing which we're, we're supposed to be against. So I think that's, to me, that's the bottom line of the question. Mark, did you have a question? Yes. Your reminiscences called to mind George Nash's excellent book, The Conservative Intellectual Tradition in the U.S. Right. since 1945, right. where he discusses the tripartite composition of the conservative movement right. as consisting of the libertarian, anti-communist, and traditional elements. Do you foresee a combination of circumstances arising in the next 10 to 25 years that would result in the reemergence of that libertarian element and the right wing returning to its libertarian heritage? Uh, well, I'd love to see it, but I don't see it. I don't think it's going to happen. Uh, the right wing has gotten, gotten worse on, on many, most questions, on non-economic questions. Uh, it's probably gotten worse since then. Uh, nuclear, <clears throat> nuclear policy is just as bad. I mean, the, yeah, nuclear war policy is just as bad. Plus, they've got all this terrorism nonsense, which they're, you know, every, everybody under every bed is a KGB agent, uh, plus the moral majority, which has shifted a lot of right-wing opinion. I mean, see, in the old days, in the 1950s and 60s, nobody talked about, you know, reestablishing theocracy or outlawing abortion or anything like that, or, or, or bringing, you know, the only, the only thing they were worried about was prayer in the public schools, which seems pretty innocuous now, you know, looking back on it. So the whole moral majority thing, I think, has shifted the uh, position much more compulsory morality viewpoint than it was in those days. So it looks like it's swinging in the other direction, except on, except on economics, where it's not that great anyway. See, the problem with the, with the right wing in economics is that they're not really that interested in it. When I was going to right wing rallies back in the 50s, uh, I was distressed to find that nobody would ever cheer, nobody, there'd be no standing ovation for the free market, right? Or for liberty or something. The only standing ovation was, you know, all, all power to Chiang Kai-shek. <laughs> so, uh, that was, there was no real, essentially conservatives, except for a few economists who are interested in economics, obviously, essentially they give lip service to the free market. Really, their hearts are really elsewhere. Their hearts are in compulsory, compulsory theocracy and uh, nuking them with the Russians. So, I mean, I'm not, I'm not ruling it out. Obviously, it's not, 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 it's not logically impossible that could happen. Well, how do you account for the, uh, the old rights and antipathy toward an interventionist foreign policy, and, and why was there uh, a lack of a theoretical connection between the free market and uh, non-interventionist foreign policy? Yeah, the, there was, there has been. The 19th century liberal, classical liberals, were totally all-out anti-interventionists. They were not anarchists, by the way. You didn't, you didn't have to, in those days, you didn't have to be an anarchist in order to be against foreign intervention. <laughs> uh, Richard Cobden, Bright, all these people, all the classical liberals were very anti-foreign intervention. They were so-called Little Englanders. They're very, quote, isolationist, unquote. And very anti-militarists. Uh, Thomas Jefferson, for example, was really in favor of disbanding the entire Army and Navy, not just against the draft, against the whole Army and Navy. So, uh, <clears throat> unfortunately, what happened was we lost, as, as the classical liberal tradition died out, we, we lost these moorings. We lost the, the remembrance of them, or, or the whole tradition. Uh, then the, the right wing was, the modern right wing was essentially created by the New Deal, 1930s and 40s, a, a reaction against the excesses, against the leap into statism of the New Deal. So the, the right wing was essentially a reactionary movement, in the sense of being reacting against uh, this new leap. So it was a coalition of everybody who was against the New Deal, which is a very broad coalition. <clears throat> And most of these people weren't philosophically oriented at all. They weren't really much, even free market particularly. So, um, but they were against the further leap into statism, and they were against then World War II. So you wound up, after World War II, with the, with the right wing, which, is, which was um, semi-libertarian, or isolationist, anti-war, anti-draft, free market. But they didn't have much of a philosophical, they didn't have any theorists much, they didn't have any readings. It was really sort of a, 
It was a mass movement without a theory. Uh, it used to be called the dumb right. That was a sort of expression in those days. It was a, in other words, there, wasn't, there was very, uh, almost no intellectual content. So what happened was in the middle 1950s, Senator Taft died. Colonel McCormick was the editor of the Chicago Tribune, which those days was an all-out anti-war publication. Uh, when these, two, these people died out and just retired, they, le they left a power vacuum, an intellectual vacuum, which National Review then could fill very well, because National Review was a brilliantly edited magazine. You know, so it was just, it cut through the right wing like a knife through butter. The, the, third, the third part of my question was, uh, earlier this year when you visited us at the University of Colorado, you said that you were coming out with a new book on the rise of you know, statism in the 19th century. Uh, could you tell us the status of that? Status is, is uh, I'm in the middle of it. In other words, this, uh, <clears throat> this was a, a book I'm working on on the, uh, on the progressive era, the origins of modern statism in the progressive era. The, uh, what happens to this is, has happened with all my books, is they get, they get longer as I, kick, as I get into it. Uh, when I first, the way I got started in my history book was that I got a, I got a small grant or, uh, to write a two-volume his, history of the United States. They said, somebody came to me and said, Murray, why don't you write a two-volume two history of the United States? Take the usual facts which everybody agrees on, like Lincoln was elected president, <laughs> something like that, and write the libertarian interpretation of it, right? Should be a lead pipe cinch. Okay, great. Could get it done in a year and a half. What happened was, unfortunately, I found out the two-volume textbooks leave everything out. You can't just take the facts and put a new interpretation on them because the facts were all left out. So I started in bringing in the facts. I find tax rebellions in colonial New Jersey. I can't leave that out, right? So the thing starts getting longer and longer, like popsy. <laughs> and I wind up with a five-volume book on the colonial period, <laughs> the rest of it dropping out. So in the progressive era, as a fascinating era, because I find out that you can't imagine the horrors that went on in the progressive period. You just can't imagine it. And every front, every conceivable front, not just the economic and foreign policy, everything. This is the era when psychiatrists take over and try to wreck everybody, doctors, I mean, you, social workers, you name it. They're all, they're all in it together. So it, it got, you know, the, the topic got bigger. I'm still, I, I will, however, I'm in the middle of it, I will, however, finish it. And anyway, that's the status of it. It's not imminent. My, imminent, my next imminent book is my Ethics of Liberty book, which is coming out this fall, uh, Humanities Press which I'm quite proud of because I think it's sort of like the scholarly counterpart of foreign new liberty. It's the, it goes into advanced problems like blackmail theory, children's rights, things like that. So uh, I put a little plug for that. Yes, you've had your hand up for a while. Okay, the gentleman asked, do I think there's a conspiracy for one world government, and uh, if so, is the trial annual commission a part of it? I don't think there's a conspiracy for one world government. Um, there's, a, there's an establishment that's in favor of international uh, political economic admixture. Uh, the, basic, the basic objective on the monetary front, for example, they really want is one world bank, like one world reserve system, issuing world paper money so that the whole world can inflate together. And uh, so you wouldn't have to worry about gold or exchange rates. Everybody would be happily inflating together. That's, that's, one, of the, that's one of the programs of the Trilateral Commission uh, sort of people. Uh, I, don't, I think in general, though, I, 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 the, the, um, we have to be sophisticated about conspiracy analysis, because most conspiracy, uh, many conspiracy theorists tend to think there's one group of bad guys sitting somewhere in some room pushing all the buttons. You know, like saying, okay, Russia and China now fight, pretend that you're enemies, and things like that. Well, it doesn't work that way. In other words, what there are is a whole bunch of competing power structures or power-oriented people, groups trying to get control of a state apparatus and, and run it. And so you have, say, four or five or six of these groups. Sometimes they're in coalition, sometimes they're fighting each other and whatever. That's, the, I think, the essence of it. And I think looking at it that way, a lot of this stuff is very important. Obviously, the Trilateral Commission was obviously running the Carter administration, for example. So, even the establishment media conceded that. We only have time for about one or two more questions, and there are a couple of people over at this mic here. So if you'd go ahead. Dr. Rothbard, what do you see as the future of the accept acceptance of the uh, Austrian School of Economics, and when do you expect to win the Nobel Prize for Economics? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the answer to the second question is very easy, absolutely not. <laughs> okay. 
Uh, Austria, I think the future is very good. The Austrian schools uh, started with Zip in the 1940s or whatever. So really only with Mises and Hayek, and that was about it. <clears throat> um, it's now grown tremendously since 1971 or three. Is th about this, you know, about coincident with the rise of the Libertarian Party, by the way. And uh, we now have conferences and seminars. We have two or three universities where we have several, like a FOCO, as they used to call it, of Austrian professors. Uh, we still haven't broken through yet. What we have to do is, is to capture, so to speak, a, a graduate department. We have to be able to get a graduate school where we can turn out Austrian doctorates. Now, we haven't gotten that yet, but we're getting close to that sort of thing. So uh, I think the future is very bright. See, one of the problems is, one of the reasons for that is that the Keynesian establishment is finished. I mean, they haven't got any, they can't solve any of these problems, and they, they know it. They can't understand why is inflationary recession all the time? Why is it, prices keep going up all the time, even though we have recessions? There's no way to explain, the free minds can't explain it either, by the way. Only the Austrians have a, a solution to that kind of problem. So I think, uh, I think the future is very good. I think it's, you know, it's, 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 it's a rapidly growing movement. It's still, uh, I guess it's the way the Libertarian Party was uh, six years ago or something. You know, that's sort of, uh, <laughs> that's sort of a parallel. All right, the last question, same mic. Thanks, ML. Murray, I've got a little gift to commemorate a special occasion in Toronto a while back, but uh, I wonder if you could just tell the audience whether it's an anarchist principle to enter strange women's bedrooms in the middle of the night. <laughs> of course. <laughs> okay, I want to get a final plug. There's the, uh, starting at this moment, there's a Center for Libertarian Studies Hospitality Suite, room 1217 to 18. Uh, at that point, we'll, uh, the Center for Libertarian Studies and outfit, which I'm intimately associated with, uh, I edited the Journal of Libertarian Studies. There's a, they're holding a scholars conference this fall, the fifth or sixth or eighth annual one. And we're kicking off the Ludwig von Mises Fellowships, which are fairly munificent postdoctorate or pre-doctorate graduate fellowships in any discipline, any uh, discipline related to libertarianism. So anyway, uh, I invite you all to attend 12, 17, 18. I'll be there myself for a while, so continue this and more informally. Thank you. Come on, more! <laughs> For your information, there are probably a couple of other places that Murray's going to be tonight. Um, I don't know what this note from Mary Lou is about, but this is a snack that was given to you. And it says hugs. Um, the Radical Caucus of Libertarian Party has a hospitality suite in room 1745 from now on. And also the Society for Individual Liberty has a cocktail party also at this time in suite 2042. Those two room numbers again are 1745 and 2042. And the first place I ever met Murray was at one of those cocktail